That sort of says a lot of it, actually. Um, I'm probably, well, I know I am not going to present you with a lot of results looking at the minutiae of measuring response to various types of, uh, <clears throat> various types of therapy. Instead, I perceive this audience as being a very large group of patients. And I thought it would be important since many, uh, many people are quite uh, internet savvy and start reading things and including medical papers on the internet, I thought it would be important to try to explain as uh, best I can um, the sorts of values that we get out of the studies, how they're very tricky to interpret and um, that I think it is often misused and abused, and I'll be even poking hot pokers at my colleagues, not fun, but hot pokers at my colleagues for the way they utilize some of these, uh, uh, some of these values. Well, the way we look at effectiveness of chemotherapy is, has been classically in uh, at least uh, two ways. What are the response rates? What does it do to survival? And perhaps the more, more useful thing in urinary carcinomas, I think, is actually time to uh, progression. And I'll point out why I think that is as the, uh, as the talk goes on. So how do we do this? Well, response rates have been uh, utilized for a long time. And you've seen many examples of this already today, if not in the previous talk. Um, Ideally, or conceptually, it makes most sense to try to relate this to the how many tumor cells are left over, and that relates to the tumor volume. But in order to do that, you need to have at least three dimensions out of a tumor volume, and practically speaking, that was difficult to do when the definitions of this first came out. So in the mid-70s, a group got together under the auspices of the World Health Organization, that's what the WHO stands for, and utilize two dimensions, which basically translates into a change in the tumor, in the tumor area. And they defined four response categories. A complete response, which is, of course, complete disappearance of tumor. A partial response, which is a 50% decrease in the tumor area. And all you had to do to determine that was to measure two diameters and compare it with the, uh, with the two, di two diameters of the other scan you were using in comparison. You didn't have to use pi and all that sort of stuff. That all canceled out. Um, and progressive disease is a um, um, it, was, it was actually debated whether it should be 25 or 50 percent, but most people take a 25 percent increase in the size of the tumor. And in between progressive and partial, you had the stable disease category. And more recently, we're now looking at tumor diameter, the so-called resist criteria, which we'll go over. But we then further partitioned these responses into complete response. And the, the sum of complete response and partial responses were called responders. That was good. You wanted response. And the sum of stable disease and progressive disease were non-responders. That was supposed to be non -good, not good because the tumor wasn't responding, and if you were achieving this, forget the therapy. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't working. However, in the mid-90s, I think uh, a lot of people recognized that um, um, generating response tables, and these are sort of response tables that you would see. You could see absolute numbers here, and then often you get the percentage of, of patients that achieve this particular definition. Um, you it was realized that the stable disease group, when you looked at that group independently, 80% of them had symptomatic improvement. And when you looked at their survival separately, they survived more like partial responders rather than progressive disease. And there's lots of good biological reasons why this may be so. So a lot of us now recognize, I believe, that stable disease is also a good um, category to get put into because uh, it tur this turns a tumor from one that has been growing to one that is no longer, no longer growing. Uh, and we believe this to represent disease that has been damaged uh, 
to the point that it can no longer divide. It's still alive and around. It's sort of like the bad neighbor, but he isn't bothering you at that uh, at that you know, at that time. Um, uh, looking at it again very metaphorically. Um, so we believe, or many of us believe now, that stable disease is roughly equivalent to a partial response in terms of its consequences to patients. Patients still like to hear the, the tumor is shrinking. That's a nice, it's got a nice sounding ring to it. But in terms of what happens to them, stable disease is probably good. And, and now we have a newer criteria, the so-called resist criteria. And this looks at the sums of the largest diameters of tumors that, um, that you can see, and they should usually be beyond a certain size depending on the organ that they're in, and they should at least usually have three or so. And then you generate something with this intriguing name of a waterfall plot, which I have an example, and this is not a neuroendocrine example, but what, what you do here is you take each one of these bars as a patient, and you order them in terms of changes in size of the tumor. And you can see that um, uh, if you look at the whole sequence, it looks sort of like a waterfall, which is, of course, why it gets called a waterfall plot. But on the top is a 20% bar, and that's where we think is the error rate in measuring all these tumors. That is, you can, you can, you can get a 20% change just because of errors in measure, measurement and errors um, that incur with the imaging technique that you utilize, such things as uh, registration uh, errors because the cut of the CT scan was slightly slid over from the, from the last time, and therefore the computer will generate a different sized image of that tumor, even though it would have not changed it at all. And below that is the 20% bar for error in the other way. And you can get a very much nicer pictorial um, view of what the uh, changes are in the tumor, and in fact, that a large group of patients are in this middle group, which we think is not changing. Again, it's probably not good to progress. It's good to have a response, but it may be equally good to have this middle group where you're not significantly changed. And it is certainly striking seeing patients that have had tumors growing and feeling unwell, and you've treated, and the uh, disease seems to stop growing, and the patient feels a whole lot, uh, whole lot better, even though you're not seeing any change on the uh, on the CT scan. But there are problems uh, with this, and uh, one of the very specific problems that we incur, especially with carcinoid tumor, is the problem of fibrosis. If you've heard the surgeons mention this in the previous uh, session, it, did. Did you all understand that term desmoplastic that they use, desmoplasticity? You probably, I hope, mostly have realized that this refers to the scarring that uh, is engendered by this tumor. And so that very often when you're imaging the tumor, you're not directly imaging the tumor itself. You're imaging the scarring that's been laid down as a result of the biological processes of the tumor. And the thing about scars, you probably know, is that once you get scars, it's there for, your, it's there for life unless of course, the surgeon goes in and removes it, and, then, and sometimes we do have to do that in a lot of cases, as was, as was pointed out. So fibrosis, for, especially for carcinoid tumor in the abdomen, is a major problem because when we image it, we're probably not imaging the tumor. We're mainly imaging the fibrosis. There's believed to be less fibrosis if, and maybe in a lot of cases no fibrosis going on with tumors in the liver, and it may be more accurate, accurate reflected by deposits in the uh, in the tumor, but within the abdomen, it's a very highly fibrotic uh, tumor. And those of us who have looked at uh, the literature um, with respect to how responses were defined in a lot of studies find that there has been a lot of variation. Um, it's been pointed out that in a lot of earlier studies, they looked at organ size, they looked at changes in markers, um, they, um, they even looked at the changes in the production of the uh, uh, various peptides or amines that are produced by the tumor as some sort of index as what's happening to the tumor. Now, the problem with all of this is it has not been uniformly done. So when you come to compare one study with another study, depending on what was chosen as the method for measuring the outcome in terms of responses, they actually aren't very comparable. And you can get widely different figures just because 
they used a different method for uh, looking at responses. They didn't necessarily use uh, size changes, which, as I said, is problematic, especially in carcinoid tumor. Well, the other thing that's looked at very often is survival. And that's usually represented with a survival curve. And the survival curve, you've seen some examples of that as well. And what you do is you set up a graph, and you have on one part the proportion that's alive from 100%, and then the other one, the time after you start treatment, or if you didn't give, or if you happen not to give any treatment, it would be the time from the diagnosis of the, uh, uh, of the tumor. And then ideally, you want to see something like this. Um, that is 100% survival all along the way. Now the thing is, this doesn't actually occur in society because we all do stupid things like drive on the 401 and get killed and, and other diseases occur and we, we have patients that have climbed on the roofs, fallen off and killed themselves and um, all sorts, of, or, or you can walk down Young Street and get in the middle of a gang war, I understand. So, um, so survival in society is somewhat, a little bit more like this. This is normal survival and survival um, that's independent of the, uh, of the disease. When you generate a survival curve of, uh, of a disease that, that can be fatal, you can generate, as an example, a curve, uh, a curve like this. And it's valuable to look at a curve like this, but it's often summarized in print by measuring something called the median survival time. Now, the median survival time, I think, is a major, major problem. Uh, basically, you take the point at which 50% of the patients are still alive, go over to the curve, and then see what, what time that is. How, what was that interval for the median survival time? The median survival time is a measure of a whole population of patients. It does not relate to any one patient. And physicians who use median survival time in their discussions with patients, even though they may think they're adequately discussing uh, uh, representing it well, patients will usually take that as meaning that's how long the doctor gave me to live. And it's not true. It doesn't work that way. It's a very limited, it's a very limited in its usefulness. It basically tells us the slope of the curve, but it doesn't relate in general to any particular patient. And you can, you can well see that unless there's an odd number of patients in this whole group, not a single person would have lived the median survival time. It doesn't relate to individual patients. It's a way of looking at a whole population pa of patients and it has a very limited usefulness in that when you compare them, uh, let me not just get, um, when you compare them, um, you can get an idea if the treatments are different and you can compare mean survivals of different populations and if they're different, you can say these are probably different populations. But, but those are mostly the limitations, uh, those are mostly the inc inclusions of which you could meet a survival time. Using it beyond that is not worthwhile. Now, some people will ask what their average survival time, and I've seen average calculated too. Now, the problem is average is a particular statistical term that's used to define a situation in which the true value in your population clusters around some value. But survival doesn't work that way. It's, it's a line, it's an exponential, this is a, actually an exponential curve, which means this is logarithmic. I won't even get into trying to explain that one, but it means that basically during each interval you have an equal time of succumbing to that disease over the, that next time. If the uh, if an average time was useful, you'd get a curve that looked like this, meaning that the deaths all clustered around some time like that. Um, I, freehand, I freehandedly draw this curve, and this shows you why I'm not a surgeon, by the way. Um, didn't, didn't do a great job on that. So the survival curve doesn't work that way. You can, you can calculate. You can take the numbers and you can calculate mean, but it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything in this because the preconditions for utilizing an average are not there. It does not have a distribution which clusters around a single value, and it should not be determined. And if you see it around, if you see it around reported, you should discount it because it means pretty well. Uh, it means pretty well nothing. So when you treat uh, a tumor and 
you look at the survival curves of the untreated versus the treated, you might end up seeing a survival curve like this, and then you generate the median survival times, and you can say, gee, the median survival time of the control group was this and was higher in, the, uh, in that group. But again, that is, that is a summary of a large group of people. It doesn't relate to any one patient, and it can be exceedingly misleading. For instance, in some studies you'll see uh, a situation like this where there will be a drop-off and then there will be this population of patients here who have had some sort of response to the tumor and when this becomes parallel you sort of start thinking, gee, this is a really good prolonged sur survival and maybe some of these are actually even cures if you follow them up long enough. But if you do the uh, median survival times, they look like they're pretty narrow. You don't pick up on this tail with that, uh, with that sort of uh, uh, statistic, with that sort of data um, representation. You really need to see the survival curve, or the other way of doing it is looking at some landmarks, looking at the three and five year survival, or, or whatever, what, depending on the tumor, whatever is most appropriate. You get a better idea of what happens with that group of patients by looking at the proportion of people that survive for that period of time. And that's very understandable to patients. That makes, that makes uh, a lot of sense. But probably the best method is to use the hazard ratio. And that's a rather complex statistical technique. Again, I'm not going to go into it other than to say the hazard ratio. Um, I think this is the easiest definition I've found on the, uh, on the internet, on, uh, on wiki. Um, the ratio between the predicted hazard for a member of one group and for that member of the other group with everything else not varying. That actually takes into account the whole survival curve. Unlike the median survival, which just is the point at 50% are still alive, this is a much better representation because it takes in the whole survival curve. So when you're looking at survival, the things you really need to look for, is there a hazard ratio, because that can be useful. It's best to look at the actual curve and um, proportion of surviving at some time of uh, some line mark is also useful. Stay away from the median survival time. It has very limited, uh, limited usefulness, even though we still, it still utilizes a lot. Um, I am amazed that some very well-known oncologists will say that based on the study that the median survival time uh, with um, out treatment was um, nine months and that with, with, with treatment it was 11.5 months and that there, therefore there was an average of, uh, of um, 2.5 months improvement in survival, which doesn't sound very good, but it's also completely inaccurate because changes in survival time are not normally distributed, so you can't talk about averages, and you can't tell within that summary, uh, that summary statistical group whether there's going to be a person who would have survived two months but now is surviving closer to two years because that's all buried in that survival curve and in that figure. You can't figure that out. There's some patients who can do a whole lot better than that, and the median survival doesn't, doesn't tell you that, and, and it's, it's completely misleading to say just because there's this difference in the median survival that you're going to live an average of two and a half months longer. That's, that's, that's absolute mathematical nonsense that doesn't, it doesn't hold. Well, chemotherapy and that's um, the approach in terms of consideration of chemotherapy is that there are two major partitions of the uh, disease that are useful in consideration of chemotherapy. There is the slow-growing disease the low proliferative disease, which is the more common, but we do have a group of very aggressive disease, and usually these are called poorly differentiated. Um, I bet you that term's been used a lot. Is there anybody here who would read a like an explanation of what the heck differentiation means? Yes? Okay. Um, differentiation is a term we utilize to look at characteristics of the tumor, and what it means is that the more differentiated a tumor is, the more it looks like and acts like the tissue that it came from. When it becomes less differentiated or undifferentiated, it takes on other characteristics and other growth characteristics 
Uh, it's harder to recognize, and very often you cannot tell where it's coming from if you uh, uh, if you don't if you otherwise don't know where the major tumor mass was. Um, it doesn't necessarily have any more of the function of the tumor. It doesn't have the appearance of that. It grows very much more rapidly, and, and in some senses, it takes on what we call very primitive characteristics because it takes on the characteristics of growing and developing tissue in the, that you might see in the fetus, which is rapidly growing, dividing to then become differentiated into tissue that has specific functions. So um, it's a different sort of tumor, but within the well-differentiated carcinomas, we now recognize, and you've probably seen this as well, and um, yes, we do do KI-67 in Canada. Um, KI-67 uh, has turned out to be a fairly useful uh, marker in a lot of substances when you determine it on the tumor tissue uh, as to how proliferative a tumor might be. And we certainly know that the higher it is, the poorer the uh, prognosis. Um, I think a lot of us are having a, well, a lot of us, I mean physicians, are having uh, some difficulty in determining what the cutoff point for this should be because we've recently defined a new categorization of tumor based on um, the grade of the tumor, which are K67 of less than 2%, 2 to 20, and then tw over 20% is taken to be a, a much more proliferative tumor. But it seems that uh, this figure of 10%, which is sort of in the middle of the, that, that middle group, is taken as the point at which the tumor seems to be much more proliferative and where I think most of us will then go to chemotherapy in that uh, uh, with figures that they, if we, uh, if we see them that high. And below that level, we're, uh, we're liable to use therapies that are not aimed at highly proliferative tumors, um, very often not chemotherapy. And the other one that's utilized is clinical behavior, because I've certainly seen the situation where I have uh, had a patient sent to me, and the uh, diagnosis was made three or four years ago, and in all that time, the tumor hasn't, Change or change much, uh, and uh, they didn't weren't doing KI 67s at that time. But we send off the original tissue, which is stored, and do the determinations, and then are absolutely surprised to find out it's 20 percent. Now that should have said those that tumor should have been proliferating and uh, uh, out of reach by this time, but nothing, nothing really happened. And on the other side of things, I've seen uh, patients with uh, 5 percent and sometimes less. And three months later, the tumor has grown significantly, despite the fact that we got that, that, that lower level. So to me, clinical behavior is also determinate. And if it comes to a conflict between the two, clinical behavior always wins. So for aggressive disease, uh, atoposide and platinum is the standard that's utilized in most situations. It has high response rates. There's survival advantage to it. Some proportion of pe uh, patients uh, achieve a long-term survival. And um, I, I think I have a handful of patients who have had complete disappearance of the tumor, and um, five or six years later, this tumor is not put in uh, reappearance. It, it happens in this, a limited proportion of, uh, of people, generally under, uh, under 20%, but it's generally very useful to utilize atoposide platinum in this group of, uh, this group of tumors. Atoposide and platinum is a an old treatment that's been around a long time. It, in fact, was a new drug when I was a trainee, which was a couple years ago. Um, and they've not found anything really better, better than that. So when you look at chemotherapy, and uh, I, should, uh, I should pay proper attribution because I lifted this out of a paper uh, on um, chemotherapy of... Uh, of neuroendocrine tumors from the um, uh, from, from the journal of um, which journal was a neuroendocrine. Well, actually, uh, Dr. Oberg, who's sitting before me, was one of the co-authors of this paper. So I'll pay I'll pay a proper attribution to that. Yes. Um, and so you get you get figures like this, and it gives you who did the work what chemotherapy they utilize, and you'll notice the chemotherapy is generally represented by uh, three letters. Uh, medical oncologists like to do this. They like to represent their, uh, their, their, their drugs in a short form by three letters. They're very familiar with it. 
In fact, they're generally more familiar with this than they are with uh, about their anniversary dates, much to their wives' chagrin. And, and we use we use this quite uh, quite often to summarize the name of the drugs and the number of patients that were uh, in that particular study. Um, those of you familiar with statistics know that the more patients you have, the greater the chances are that you'll get a better representation of the uh, of the entire population, and that you can you can. Uh, get wide variation when you use very small groups of patients, like here's one that was with seven. And here's the response rates. And if you look at various drugs, now I'm, I, I could say that if you look at this and memorize it and pass an exam on this right after this talk, you will get a free Lexus. Um, but from the org meeting organizers, of course, not from me. Um, but in fact, you don't, the purpose of this is not for you to have this and look at this and figure out what is the, the best stuff. This is the sort of stuff that we look at and we notice that there's wide variation in response rates. And it goes back to that problem I mentioned in the beginning. How are they measuring the response? What are they using to measure the response? And there's considerable differences, as was pointed out in the uh, paper by uh, Oberg et al. I, I've forgotten who the first author was of that paper. Um, but his point on that paper is that there's, if you look back in the papers and look at their methodology, that there was very different methodology utilized in some of the papers in defining what constituted a response. And that's why we get such a, one of the reasons why we get such a, vari a variable um, uh, response rate. And this is the median overall survival again. And in a lot of cases, it was never, it was never determined, and which is generally, um, it's generally all over the place. So we, 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 uh, we see this, we see that there is some activity in um, carcinoma of, of, of a carcinoid, but most, uh, most physicians and even most oncologists, if asked, will say, uh, carcinoid tumor? No, that's not responsive to chemotherapy. It's not worth trying. Um, and I think most heads of medical oncology in Canada will say, you can't treat neuroendocrine carcinomas. It doesn't respond to anything. Why? Don't even, don't even bother. Um, I, I mentioned the metaphor of the zebra in the beginning and the stripes, and that we're, we, haven't, we haven't properly evaluated all the stripes. I can quite well imagine that metaphorically, uh, most of those people believe that the stripes are right in the very, uh, very hind quarters and therefore represent a bunch of crap. Um, I hope that is not true, but it seems to be. Okay, um, are you running out of time? Uh, streptozonazin, serendipitous agent that was discovered, I won't go the story, and pancreatic endocrine tumor. Um, it has much higher response rates and it's useful. Um, so for chemotherapy of NETS, aggressive disease, atopicide platinum is useful. For pancreatic endocrine tumor, some combination of streptozosin with other drugs is useful. We need attention to outcome measures. We need more significant number of patients. We need to delineate factors that may determine the chance of benefit from many of these uh, therapies, which would include looking at pathological features, biochemical, molecular features, and clinical indicators. There are other neuroagents, uh, temozolomide being a very interesting one. The biologic agents have already been covered, so I won't have to cover that at all, and I think that the future of chemotherapy of NETS will be determining the role of these in combination with other treatment modalities, surgery, targeted therapies, biologic therapies, and that none of this will go forward unless the support and treatment of this hitherto orphan, so-called orphan group of malignancies. Thank you.